When I come back from Vietnam is when yeah. I learned. And I asked him how you learned to do it, because I had always drawn. I said, well, I'd like to learn to do this. Well, I don't really know if I won any. Cliff was a game changer for me. But Cliff was my first influence to see the possibilities of Japanese tattooing. First, thank you for your service. Oh, thanks. I know you are a vet. Yep. I did my homework and I saw that you uh, were in the Army. Yep, yep. And then after you got out is when you decided to... When I come back from Vietnam is when yeah. I learned. I had 15 months to do when I came back from Vietnam because I had joined for three years to get it over with. Yeah. Yeah, didn't know nothing time about it. The, that was the time, Oh, right? they draft you till you're 25, so I turned 19 and went into service, you know. Get it over and done with. Yeah, it was my plan. <laughs> wow. So I would then, do it again. <laughs> no, yeah. I it, I would do it again because I bought a house, went to college on the GI Bill, and I okay. learned to tattoo. I didn't have no interest in tattooing before I went. Right, but, and I uh, read that you were with a buddy that went to get a tattoo. I was with a buddy, and he went. there was two shops in Fayetteville, D.C. Pauls and a guy named Steve Moat John that they called Poison John. It was an old, like, motorhome beside the road. The windows were all painted yellow. Yeah. And he was a handyman, and he, he'd do it at night. And my buddy went and got a zigzag man. I went, well, that's kind of cool. Maybe I'll get a little star on my finger or something. And I asked him how you learned to do it, because I had always drawn, ready the Zeiss school of tattooing. Ah, oh, fuck that. So I go up to Dave Pauls, and I said, well, I'd like to learn to do this, but I don't really know if I won any, because it was illegal in Indiana when I was a kid. Yeah. It was banned. So yeah, I'll teach you for money, and there's where it started, you know, got my foot in the door. But you also had a fine arts degree? Yeah, yeah, I went to college. Uh, yeah, I've got a master's degree in sculpture, fine arts. So you already had the itch of wanting to do the art stuff. Oh, I've always, yeah, I've always, I mean, you know, I'm a great artist, but yeah, I used to do welded abstract steel and all. Now I make more like folk art stuff. I've always liked to draw and make stuff and piddle and stack rocks or whatever it is. It's all art to me. Yeah. Be very observant, you know. So I have a master's degree and, uh, you know, that and a dime, a buy you stuff. I mean, I can teach sculpture at a college level, but it's all just process, you know. I mean, yeah. you say, okay, let's make plaster molds, let's make fiberglass molds, you know. I mean, I got a degree that's uh, not being used, so yeah, I, yeah, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. Mine hangs in my storage <laughs> building, and I used to put Dana runs an MFA, you know, and of course they'd come up with some slang, you know, what it meant that I was the artist, and I go, that was just funny because back then, you know, Cliff Raven had a degree, and uh, Spider Webs was from I don't know the Virgin of you know Montezuma or some shit, I don't know, but Cliff had went to Indiana University. Yeah, I actually did an episode on Cliff. No, oh, yeah, Cliff was a great guy. And, uh, you know, I, I knew a little bit about him, but once I, you know, started to dig in and do my, my background, yeah. and, and I was fascinated. Yeah, And um, Cliff was a game changer for me. And your name kept popping up when I was looking through the stuff. Yeah. That's why I was excited to meet up with you. Yeah. And then when I ran into you in New York, I was like, oh shit, here's my shot. Yeah, yeah. Because really, to be honest with you, had that not happened, yeah. I was gonna drive out to you. Yeah, yeah, shop. Cliff did my lower arms in LA, he did uh, you know, my upper arm, he tied all my old ones together in Chicago. And that was a game changer. I walked in there and he had a Hanya by uh, Don Nolan on his shoulder. And I'm like, whoa, that's like magic looking. Yeah. And then I, you know, got to know Cliff pretty well. And then years later, I met Nolan. And we became really good friends. And Nolan did my back and my ribs, and we hung out together. I knew Cliff, and he was really nice. He had Bob show me how to make needles, and he was real supportive. He even offered me a job, you know, which would have been my dream. But my son was two years old, and I just couldn't move. But but Cliff was my first influence to see the possibilities of Japanese. Tattooing. And what this could really be. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, it was just what it could be. You know? I mean, let's let's talk about that for a second. Did you ever in a million years think this would have turned into what it turned into? No, never. In 1971, there was two to 300 tattoo artists in the world, you know, none in Indiana. You know, Cliff was the only one in Chicago. It used to be yeah. Chicago was busy, and then they raised the age to 21. So yeah. Cliff was up there with Buddy McFall and Del Groundy. And then they'd send everybody to Greg May in Lake Geneva if they were underage. Mm. And Greg got murdered, unfortunately, by some people they knew. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. God, it was horrible. They said they cut his head off or something. They he had a big gun collection or some shit. But I only met Greg May once. But friends of mine have a lot of his flash. And he was a nice guy. 
you know, I go up to cliffs and I'm like, oh man, this is the real, you know, I lean over the counter like, hey, I tattoo where you guys get your equipment. And they're like, what the fuck are you? <laughs> and then, and then Cliff really was nice to me. You yeah. know, I'd go up there and I went up a couple times and I followed him. I, I, I had panic attacks, so I quit flying for eight years. So I drove to California twice to get tattooed by Cliff, you know, and he was just, you know, he was my idol. That ride either sucks. Oh, it sucked. Or it's great if you make the best of it. It sucks. I took my mom out once and my son okay. was about two and, you know, they all went sightseeing and I'm in there with Cliff. Yeah. You know, I'm just like, ah, man, nobody can tattoo like this, you know. And, uh, I, you know, I'd heard of Nolan and Dale Grundy had worked by Cliff and Ed Hardy. So I'd heard of Ed Hardy, but, I, you know, I didn't know anybody. Nolan was real elusive. Mm -hmm. He was like Von Dutch, like, where's Nolan? You know, he's on a sailboat. Yeah. Where's Nolan? I followed him to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Where's Nolan? He's in St. Paul. He just had such a following, nobody cared if he was famous. You know, he was just yeah. good. So, yeah. And to me, like, you know, now you're also held in that high regard as well. Yeah, I'm not that guy, but I, I got to but know you him are. all. And you are though, like you're up there, you know what I mean? And knowing that you spent time with all those other guys that yeah. we all hold in high sure, regard. Sure. And you worked with them and just did, you know what I mean? Like, I, I to me, I can't fathom in my mind what it would have been like to just have a group of friends like that. Yeah. That wound up being these. Well, I go up to Nolan's and work a little in his shop. Cliff just showed me how to make needles. You don't need. You know, you still buying needles from Spalding? Let, let me show you how to make them. And it's still the best way. Dr. Mm -hmm. Lemus did all the secrets of Raven and Hardy, and he published them. Well, I've got that publication that shows you how Cliff set up stuff. And they were all pissed off because he published them. Mm -hmm. You know, they were giving him it because he was a doctor. They're giving him his trade secrets where you buy the pigment yeah. and stuff. Uh, but yeah, but Nolan, you know, was really my good friends. I'd go down to visit Paul Rogers because I had learned from DC Paul that learned from Huck and Paul. Right. And, you know, build machines and he'd tell me what he knew. Just the kindest man. I, I met his granddaughter yesterday. He was here just for a minute. I saw that. That's yeah, awesome. Amy. And I said, you know, if you're going to, I said, he's an example to follow. And I tried to be that guy. Not, you just ought to be that guy. You share your knowledge. You have fun. You know, I had an ego when I started. Like, I'm gonna be a good tattoo artist. You know, I was doing pretty good in magazines, and here comes all these guys by you. You know, and you're like, I'm still an okay tattoo artist. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, for my age, I'm I'm okay, and uh, I actually think I'm better than I used to be because you keep learning tricks. My hands are fine, my eyes are fine, my back's yeah. fine. No, I mean, I, I still think your stuff is awesome. I yeah. mean, I asked you, I was like, hey, man, when I hit you up on Instagram and yeah. I said we were going to meet up to do this, yeah. and I was like, hey, uh, do you think I could? And you were like, I'm not tattooing. Yeah. I'm like, damn it. But that means I'll just take a ride out to this. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, I do kind of my style. I either do Japanese or those crazy doodles I do, which I, which I did in college. You know, use the ink eyedropper and the mistakes are part of it. Or I do a vintage traditional, 1900 to 1950s, 40s. I love that stuff, and and I'm okay at that. You know, I, I used to do portraits and tribal. I'm not great at that. It, right. You had to do it, so I try to send people to somebody. If I can't do it, I send them to somebody that's good at it. Right yeah. now, so like your shop uh, at the beginning, was it more of a street shop? You did whatever came in the door. Sure. Yeah, me and the other guy. I, I moved over. There was one shop in Cincinnati. I met him in '76, and he was partners with a guy, but the guy was a gun engraver. So he only worked part-time. So my buddy wanted to do it full-time. So he moved out and invited the guy to come, rented a shop. I met him at the first convention. He said, gee, Dana, you know, I only work noon till five if you ever want to come over. So I went to SMU to graduate school in Texas and six months I had a scholarship, but the rent was real high. So I thought, man, I'm going back and going to this tattooing, you know. Mm. And then I eventually went to University of Cincinnati for graduate. But yeah, I moved back, paid rent for an apartment. I had a hundred bucks left. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this better work, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I was the night shift, you know, five till nine. But then again, if I was doing a bunch of bikers, I could stay till midnight, you know, we're all drinking beer and partying and shit. So, and then I worked there 11 years and then I wanted to do kind of a more artistic thing. Yeah. And we, we were friends till he passed, you know, we shook hands and I moved, you know, out of town, but I worked both places for a year because nobody was out of kind of the Skid Row area. You know, there weren't any out in the country or in a shopping mall, Yeah. but I had established a good client and we were the only shop in town. So now there's two shops. So I get people from, you know, West Virginia, Indiana, Chicago, they drive and get a tattoo. Yeah. And then uh, Robert Benedetti who's my friend from California, don't cliff shop. 
we became friends, which was weird, because Robert and I were totally opposite. And uh, he'd say, you need to hire somebody, Dan. No, nah, no, nah, I don't want to hire nobody. You know, so I taught a kid, and he kind of helped teach my wife, and then my son learned. So I had two shops with 12 top-end artists. Wow. You know, at one time. And I, I sold my other shop uh, a couple years ago to a kid that worked for me 20 years, Tommy, and Anita. And he was loyal, and I knocked 20000 off the building, gave him everything in it. Wow. And I offered that to a kid my son and uh, had taught him and his wife. And I come back from London, they're like, we're going to open our own shop. I go, you are, dude. I'm going to sell you mine for less than the building. I have no idea what that move was about. It wasn't a great business move. Hmm. But, you know, I give everybody a handshake. You got to go, go. Yeah. So then I was just down to one girl, and I told her she could quit. And she goes, no, I love working here. And now I've got two other girls, and then a guy wants to move up. Uh, he comes and visits me, Kevin Brandenburg from Kentucky. He used to have a couple of shops, work all over Cincinnati. Real solid tattooist. But he's got another two-year lease about an hour and something away. But he's got a big clientele in Cincinnati. So he's hoping to move up there and, and work in my shop. Okay. And hell, if he works long enough, he can buy my shop. I don't care. <laughs> I was selling it for the price of the building, or less yeah. than the building. Yeah. But yeah, it worked out real good for me. See, so you and I have uh, something else in common too, where uh, I know you have a, a, a very deep interest in motorcycles. Oh yeah, yeah, I've rode bikes since I was like, yeah, let's see, well, I had a mini bike when I was 16, and my first bike was a panhead chopper. Wow. You know, I bought it, uh, I was working at a, a Lane Bryant, the big, I'm big right. and tall. Yeah. Yeah. It was by my house and I was working there and it was $800. You know, suicide shift, triumph, front end, just a piece of shit. And then I, then when I got out of the army, the only time I didn't have a, a bike when I went to Vietnam. As soon as I come back, I bought another chopper. It was fifteen hundred dollars. There was no chopper worth fifteen hundred dollars, but this was all molded in and mm -hmm. shit. Well, I built a bunch of bikes. I opened a bike shop when I got out and custom painted bikes and sold parts. Okay. Because Harley didn't sell accessories. Yeah. I had a little hole in the wall shop, you know. Yeah. And then I'd tattoo all the bikers, you know, because regular people weren't getting tattooed, you know. Yeah. Go, go girls and bikers and maybe one or two crazy people. <laughs> it's funny you yeah. say that because uh, that's really how I remember it. Yeah. And, and you know, that's the thing is, uh, you know, so I, I, I mean, I started getting into this in 92. So yeah. way after you were involved, yeah, right? Yeah. But even back then, there was still this, like, mystique about it where... You weren't sure when you walked into certain tattoo shops. Right. You were worried, like, man, am I going to get thumped in here? Or well, see, it, was, gonna be it was illegal in Indiana, so I set up a studio in my shop. Oh, okay. You know, it was underground. So yeah. I had my bike shop, and on the weekends, I'd drag everything out and tattoo all these one percenters, you know, or they'd come to my house. And I'm like, man, I'm making $100. i am doing $10 eagles or swastikas. But, man, I make $75 a week working. I'm making 100 tattoo, and you know, I'm doing good. Plus, they were all my buddies. Right. I still like bikers. I still ride bikes. My wife rides a bike. They kept me busy when nobody was getting tattooed. You know, tattooing was really looked down on. Yeah. Now you're the cool guy. You're the tattooist. Before you're the fucking scum of the earth. Yep. You know, people smoke weed. You're a junkie. Now it's mainstream. I go, well, you guys are just late. You know, I did all that <laughs> shit early. You know. <laughs> late to the party, man. Yeah, yeah. I um, I just think that there is a different breed that comes through a breed of people that was born during that time frame. Yeah. And now the younger guys and the, that are getting involved in that don't understand that. No, they don't understand. And they'll never get it because things have changed that much within, let's yeah. say, call, let's yeah. call it even 20 years. I made it easy. The pen is a great invention, unfortunately, made it easier to tattoo. There's yeah. no apprenticeship. You buy a pen, plug in a needle, buy the ink, you go. Mm. We had to build machines. I've got a couple hundred machines I've messed with trying to get a good machine. Yeah. And I've got all good machines, but I'm OCD, so I'm nuts. But you know, I solder needles, make pigment, try every experiment I could try. Now you just buy it, and there you go. Yeah. You know. Off to the races. So, you know, so it's great for them. It's just not my thing. I know the pen works. I know Dan Cubans work beautiful, that machine. I'm just a coil guy. Somebody's got to kind of keep their tradition alive, you know? Yeah. Because when I went to the first convention, I stood there wishing old guys would talk to me, you know, Bob Shaw and Doc Webb and, oh, geez, just everybody, Elizabeth Weinzel and Cliff Raven I knew, and I knew my brother in D.C. Paul in 76. That's all I knew. 
And I stood there, you know, like a bump on a log, wishing somebody would talk to me, because I said, man, these guys are fucking cool. These are <laughs> pirates or cowboys, you know. Fuck, I don't even want to talk to them, you know. I'll just stand here. <laughs> so I tried to be real approachable, because th there is no secret. The right. secret's being a decent person like Paul Rogers, sharing your information. Yeah, I'm secure in my work. Fuck, open next door to me. I don't give a shit. I saved my money, you know. Yeah, but even that's changed. You yeah. Know? I mean, we're back in the day, uh, you, it was unheard of to open up a shop on top of some. Oh, you wouldn't do it. There's seven in my neighborhood now. I mean, guys that, you know, try to blow you up or kill you. Yeah. You know, I, like I said, man, we used to, by Saturday, we'd have 40 people waiting by one o'clock. Wow. Now I'll go in and do an appointment. I might throw a rock and hit one person looking for piercing that I don't do. <laughs> the girls work mainly off of Instagram and yeah. they work a few days. That a week. seems to be the way to uh, yeah, publicize yeah. now. It's just different, man. Uh, COVID killed all my walk in. The people that worked for me kept the doors closed for about two years because they got all the appointments at my shop. And, you know, they take them all to their shop. I don't care. You know, I'm fine, man. You right. know, they could all quit. I'm good. You know, um, I, I didn't know this until just recently because I, I always like to try to at least do a little bit of background so this way when I'm talking to somebody, yeah. I, I, I know what the fuck I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I don't know why I breezed over this at some point, but I, I, I've seen all the Richie Pan stuff. Yeah. And then the other day when I was doing my stuff to make sure I was prepped for you, yeah. and then I saw the interview with Richie, and I go, I've seen those, I don't know how many times, and never even... Made the connection. Yeah. yeah, man, like, I don't know why. Yeah, I met Richie and did a little Corday tattoo on him, and I went to the smoke out. And uh, Jeff Cochran's a buddy of mine. He said, hey, Richie Pan was here. You know, he wanted to give you something. He'll give it to you tomorrow. So I'm driving to Artoria Gibbons' grave. She's buried in Bristol, Tennessee. Okay. And Red Gibbons is buried in L.A. But uh, her daughter had a son. He got killed in a motorcycle wreck. He's buried in Bristol, Tennessee. So I'm out in the country, and somebody called and said, Richie Pan got killed. I go, well, no, Richie Pan didn't get killed. I just saw him. Him, him and the other guy crossing the road, running across the road, got hit and killed. Yeah. And so, you know, I was, I'm, I'm still friends with his sister on Facebook. You know, we lost our son seven years ago to depression. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah, I am too, because he was a wonderful guy. You know, my grandson's into jazz trombone, you know, and it was hard for him because my son nice. passed. Uh, he'll be 20, and he's a wonderful kid, and he gets everything we own. But he don't even care. He doesn't have a clue, you know, what we own. Yeah. You know? What, I, you know, you're talking about passing that stuff on to your grandson. How did you get into the whole collecting thing? I, was it just, just happened? I don't have a clue. Dave Paul gave me a nickel on a chain. I paid him for every tattoo, and he goes, this is the gap, your shader, right? So then, uh, yeah, that's cool. Then I go visit Paul Rogers. He gives me a dime with a little 22 slammed through it, the casing, and there's little holes in it. And he poked those out for silver contact points. He'd solder them onto the tips of the springs. Okay. That was my first collectible. And, and it's not for sale for $100,000. You right. can't buy it from me. You can't buy it from me. And then I pick up a little bit. There wasn't no uh, internet, you know, but like, you know, somebody would give me something or I'd be at an advertising show, see one sheet of flash. Then when my son learned to tattoo, he tattooed 25 years. Man, he loved it. I said, I can leave you money or we can buy tattoo stuff. Hell, let's buy tattoo stuff. So we just started really buying anything we could find. A good collection, okay. you know. And now I got it. What the hell am I going to do with it, you know? Yeah, but you have an amazing collection from what I've seen Yeah, so I don't far. have the biggest, but I got some really rare items. Yeah. You know, really good items that are museum quality, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, if my grandson's not interested in any, I know the guys and where to sell it. But I'd want him to be interested in the stuff I painted for his father, like his machine box, or I painted a big tattoo lady. I hope he's interested in that. But if he's not, it has to go to tattoo guys. But you know what? I think there's going to be things for him that are going to have some sentimental value. I think so. I think so. He, that it, it's going to hit him. And yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, I, my dad died when I was 19. Yeah. And I'm still carrying around sure. these wood ducks that he collected sure, sure. and these uh, die cast metal cars. Sure. So I'm 50 years old sure. and I've, I still got them. I've got a plaque my grandfather burned, uh, burned this comic on it. God, when I was a kid, it hung above the phone, the little phone stand. Yeah. It, it's out in our cabin. Nobody knows it's my grandfather's. That's you know? awesome. I've got a picture of my mom in makeup class in high school. She's the clown. Mm. Nobody knows my mom's the clown and they probably won't know. But I'm real sentimental. They're gonna know now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm real sentimental about stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, 
it's you know it's just hard for my grandson losing his dad. I'm sure. And you know, I've got paintings my son did. He was a big, you know, really world known graffiti artist. And uh, there's big tributes to him, R.I.P. Rapes, R.I.P. Speedbeard on Instagram. You know, when he passed, 40 guys flew in from all over the country and did three oh, days wow. walls for him. I mean, he just loved it. If he could have made a living doing that, he would have graffitied every day. Yeah. And Rapes was to rape the countryside, to plunder, pillage, nothing to do sexual. Right, right, right. And I thought, well, that's good. You're going to piss everybody off. Plus, it's a double meaning, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so we're getting ready to do a book on his black book collection. He has all these early writers from New York, and I probably had one of the best collections in the United States. Wow. And we're going to do a book and publish it under his name, a, a black book collection. Now, how long is your, uh, don't you have like a family collection book that you put out? Yeah, yeah, we do. And how long has that been out? Oh, uh, gee, I don't know, probably a couple years. Uh, we were never going to do a, a book on our collection. We wanted people to come see it. And then when my son passed, uh, Jeremy McCullough, that owns New Life Tattoo, and Mr. Flash Machine, he knew my son real well. He said, we ought to do a book. And Clinton Heather Vault worked on it. And uh, Vincent Aguilera. And I said, okay, we'll do a book. And got it, it just took forever because they'd drive over five hours and then they'd photograph. But we had 1,500 done. They got 300 uh, for doing the book. I get 50 to Clinton Heather for free. 50 to Vincent for doing the computer work, 100 to Jeremy, and I sold him 100 at cost. So I've sold all of them except I've got eight here and I've got 10 at home that I plan on keeping. Okay. And it's a one-time printing. It's a nine-pound book. I just saw it for yeah, the first yeah, time today. Yeah, it's a killer it book. A huge book. It, it was $200. I don't want to print it again. You know, I was offered to print it again. I go, no, I want it to be collectible. Yeah. Well, you know, you can't get a better reference book than this if you're into old flash. It's not a history book. It's a reference book. Right. So everybody that buys it just loves it. I still think if you don't like it, I'll give you $200 back because when it's out of print, it'll be $500. But, you know, I give the first one to my grandson. We put all the money in my grandson's account just nice. to add with our money. Same with Don Nolan, you know. I mean, it's all for him. I don't, I don't need the money. I'm okay. Yeah. You know, same with the graffiti book. I'm putting that out in memory of my son. I'm not doing it to make money, dude. I don't care if I break even or lose money on it. You don't come across as that type of guy. No, nah, no. Nah. Well, I, I did okay. I lived in Ohio. I bought my buildings cheap. I bought my house cheap. Yeah. I worked my ass off. You know, I went to college five days a week, worked six nights a week. I worked six days a week with my son. You know, we wouldn't turn nothing away. So I saved my money and it was cheap and I bought some houses and I bought some buildings and at the end of it, you're like, wow, I did pretty damn good. I can go anywhere I want and, you know, and that is one of the things that I'm seeing now. I mean, every time I turn around, you're in goddamn Amsterdam or it's because, Budapest. It's because I went to a therapist after I, my son passed, right? I quit tattooing for eight months. My wife quit for five years. And he said, Dana, you got to engage in life. And then he passed. But those were the truest words. Because when I'm talking to you about tattooing and I'm talking to young guys, I'm happy as a clam. And I talk to my son every day. I talk to him every night. I kiss his picture, lay my phone beside there. He's my son. I love him dearly. You know, yeah. bad things happen to people. But if I can help one kid, if you're a depressed man, message me, you know, not that I can save you, but I'll sure give you my best wishes. Mm. It is a temporary situation, you know, right. and it, and it I'd trade everything in the world and shovel shit if I could have my son back. That's right. all icing on the cake. But I worked with my son 25 years. I'd call him. We were best friends. He never drank. He never did drugs. He's a super honor student. It's just depression. And he tried everything. He tried all the medicines. It just didn't work. So bad things will eventually happen in your life. You're going to fucking die. I had a therapist once say, you a pessimist? Do you think something bad's going to happen? Well, if you wait long enough, something bad's going to happen because you're going to fucking die. <laughs> or your cat's going to die or your friends are going to die. I've had a lot of friends die. Yeah. And I'm 75, dude. And I'm like, ooh, geez, I'm healthy. You right. know, it's scary. Yeah, I mean, you get around great. Oh, uh, yeah. We still ride bikes. My wife's 72. We ride bikes. We travel. We travel just to share any bit of bullshit knowledge we know with those who are interested. I don't give a shit about photorealism pens. I don't know nothing about them. Mm -hmm. But for the guys that are interested, I always go, I'm a cabin boy. The real pirates are dead. So if I'm a cabin boy, all these guys saying their pirates, what the hell does that make you? I'm a cabin boy. <laughs> the real guys are dead. And I keep going looking for my past, and it's gone. Dave Heap's in England. He's about 77. Wonderful guy. Retired. Doc Price is there. He's 92. And he's still tattooing. He'll still do a tattoo at a convention, but he makes Damascus swords and all. Just a wonderful guy. 
Well, I love those stories and all. That's the part. I don't care how good you can draw. Yeah. I love the characters, man. And that, to me, is why I'm doing this channel, because um, it would it would be a hell of a lot easier for me to do all the flashy new stuff oh, and throw yeah, it out there yeah. and get a 1,000 views and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. all. But you know what? It doesn't resonate with me. Now, I've the been history. to every art museum in the world, dude. I know good art. Right. And these artists aren't it. If you aren't Michelangelo, I don't give a fuck what, how good you draw. You're an airbrush artist. I saw vans going from pinstriping and flame to wizards on the side because I painted those. Mm -hmm. and now it's back to pinstriping and flames. Right. So it all dazzles me. It's beautiful. But it just doesn't look like a tattoo. It, it's, to me, it seems like it's, it's a big uh, circle, though. It there, is. I think that there's this renaissance of American traditional stuff. There is, back. which I was glad to see it, man. You know? Yeah. And I love him poke tattoos and you know and i love the pin stuff that's wizards on the side of a van yeah. you know the iconography doesn't look like a tattoo japanese tattooing traditional tattoo, it looks like a tattoo if it's done right right and i don't need to reinvent that i mean you know i thought i was going to reinvent it you know drawing hippy dippy shit and uh, i've done realistic stuff off of lithographs i've done watercolors i've done single needles now i'm back to kind of clunky 1920s 1930s stuff it's just fun it looks like a tattoo yeah you know, and you that's when you, you think tattoo like that's that's the, what I, I said I if you vision. stick a knife through it it's a tattoo and i don't have a knife through <laughs> nothing on me but you see a panther head with a knife that's tattoo right you know you see a panther head by itself that's an illustration you know you see mom and a rose that's tattoo now they don't all have to be i could but the way they're tattooed they look like tattoos right and that's just for my my group the other group can do whatever they want to do. I love hand poke tattoos, Polynesian tattooing, Samoan tattoo. I love all that stuff. Right. I, I actually want to get one. Yeah, I wanna, yeah. I don't know. I, every time I go and there's somebody at a convention doing it and I go, is it? Uh, and they look and go, you're tattooed. What? It's. Yeah. <laughs> In my mind, though, I think to myself, it's got to hurt worse. Yeah, well, I had uh, Nakano, uh, Horiyoshi, and I had Horitoshi, but the little piece on my leg, it wasn't bad. You know, it wasn't bad. Uh, I wish I had room for more stuff. I know a guy from Norway that does all Viking tattoos by hand. Oh, absolutely man. perfect. This young girl here is doing this, tapping with a stick. Her, her symmetry is so good, it blows my mind. I mean, these parallel lines and patterns, I couldn't do it for a million dollars. And she's got a stick and hitting it and doing this perfect pinstriping. Right. And I complimented her. I said, wow, it's just beautiful. You know, I, you know, if you can't do it, you're going to appreciate somebody else that does it. Right. You know, I mean. So, I mean, I, I, I think I already kind of know this question, but like out of the old generation, guys that came way before you, who do you feel like is had the most interesting life? Well, mine's Ben Corday, big Ben Corday. You know, okay. called him a giant. He tattooed. I think he died or early 30s, maybe 30 to 38, but I've got some of his flesh, and it was just beautifully drawn. Yeah. Bob Wicks, Tom Berg, George Burchett, uh, God, Southern McDonald, you know, tattooed at the turn of the century. Yeah. Just fucking phenomenal, dude. And we're talking about with weird machines and drawing it on or plastic stencils. Give a kid a plastic stencil now. They were hard for me to do, man. You mm. know, the hectograph changed the whole rule. You don't wipe it off. Right. You know, or let your pen break. How are you going to fix it? You know, I can rebuild a machine 20 minutes. Yep. You, they, you can't get needles. I can go solder needles all day. I can mix ink. It doesn't make me better. It's just a different time. I did an episode on Burchett, and um, I don't know how many hours of research I put into that. Yeah. But I did it, put it together, had all my bullet points together, and then I had some questionable stuff that I wasn't 100% sure. Right. So on my channel... I do the best I can to make sure my research is right. Sure, sure. I never want to put out bad information. Right. And if I don't know, I will say I don't know. Oh, well, sure, sure. And I had these two pieces that I was like, man, I, I'm just not 100%. And I actually reached out to Matt Lauder. Yeah, yo, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, he's a genius on that stuff. So he helped Lauder. me out yeah. with some of that stuff. And yeah. uh, it, dude, I, that was probably one of my favorite episodes that I did yeah to hear some of those things that were being done way back then oh yeah well they were single new they were like illustrators like I met this guy it's uh, Tracy and Terry 
Dino. Well, one of them is a man. Oh, it must be Terry. And he said, I helped Leslie Burchett load that stuff for Lyle Tuttle. Wow. Because Lyle was way ahead of you and probably went over there and bought it for nothing. And I said, well, do you wake up screaming at night? Because, you, you know. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> the stuff wasn't worth nothing. So that's the other part that, you know, we can all sit here and go, man, none of us thought, you know, especially you older guys that have been around a lot longer than me. Yeah. And go, man, we never thought it would have turned into this. And then you hear stories about, like, Wagner. Yeah. Where they, like, kind of threw his shit out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ben Corday died in a, a boarding house. So there's probably, you know, maybe 12, 15 original Ben Cordays in the world. I own two of them. I own 15 production sheets. Okay. It's just absolutely killer. The first sheet I got, I didn't even know it was from Ben Corday. It was from L.A. It was from Tennessee Dave. I go, that's beautiful. You know, I bought it with a bunch of sheets that ended up being Harry Lawson and stuff. You know, I wow. just thought it was beautiful. And Dave and T Greg James is Tennessee Dave's brother. Yeah. They're like my family. I love those guys, you know, and Dave passed. And uh, the second one, uh, Don Lucas's wife passed, and he knew I collect uh, Ben Corday, and I, I gave $5,000 for the sheet, you know. That's the most I've ever paid for a sheet. Right. You know, uh, I think my son gave 5000 for an early Coleman sheet, which at the time was too much, but he bought it for me for Christmas, you know. Oh, wow. But I've got sheets for... Thirty-five dollars that are worth three hundred, three thousand dollars. Yeah, it, it's just nuts. It, it, it was disposable equipment. I used to never sign my own flash. Nobody give a shit. You know, you give it away. Right. Uh, so people go, this is attributed to somebody. Nah, you know, a lot of artists like Fred Thornton would cross out Joe Lieber's name and write Fred Thornton, but you can read Joe Lieber right through it. I own some. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, Carl Bliley that worked in Cincinnati. Whether he cross out Cliff Raven's name, Carl Bliley. Yeah, you know, whatever I think you drew it. Well, I don't. You know, I just say I steal it all, man. You know, <laughs> I steal from the best sources. I've actually heard of uh, that before. Uh, oh, they all did it, man. And yeah. and I didn't know that until I started digging into some yeah. of this stuff, and I was like, wow, that's crazy. But when I, you know, I did an episode on Wagner because to me it felt like it was a good jumping off point for the United States. Oh, sure it is, sure it is. And, yeah, he um, took over Samuel Riley's thing, you know, and. Yeah, his his nephew's Keith Wagner. Okay. Uh, no, his his brother was Stephen Wagner. That was a tattooed man. Well, Stephen Wagner's I don't know great grandson or something. And Keith's a biker, and I know him. He's a great guy. But that's as far back as you can go. Marvin Moskowitz. Yeah. His dad was Walter. His dad uh, learned from Charlie Wagner. Yeah. That's as far back. And Charlene Gibbons. Her mother was Artoria Gibbons. And she, Charlene's about 87, 88 now. Well, I met her mother in the 70s. Charlene shared booths with me. She doesn't have a tattoo. Now, absolutely, Charlene Ann Gibbons on Instagram. She'll, she loved her mom and dad dearly. I have one red gibbon sheet. I have a lot of stuff of Artoria when she was young. And I finally chased down a picture of 1980 when I met her. We didn't have cell phones, but this photographer documented her standing outside a tent. Oh wow! And I and he he's his name Shelby Lee Adams. He does Appalachian photography. And I contact him. Kind of, he finally said, "I found the negative," so I bought the the picture. That's awesome. You know, and I had I had Artoria sign Spider Webb's book in the late seventies when I met her. She's about eighty years old, you know. And she goes, "No, I look better." You know, just let me sign the book. And then I had her daughter sign the same book. That's awesome. And that to me is as cool as it gets. Or talking to. Paul Rogers' granddaughter. She goes, oh, thanks yeah. for keeping my grandfather, you know, his memory alive. And, you know, like, I, I'm not a tattoo artist, but I've had a lot of tattoo artists help me out in this mission. That sure, I'm well, yeah, yeah. Whether it's, you know, sitting down with an interview like today with you, yeah, yeah. but even, um, you know, different guys pointing me in different directions. Sure, sure. And to me, that's just, um, you know, it makes me feel at least a little bit a part of it. You well, know, you are part of it because you care about it. And I do. And I mean, I, people it, will say, well, tattoos, you know, if they aren't tattoo artists, they shouldn't own this stuff. Well, sure they should. I own Netskis and woodblock prints. I'm not Japanese, but I love it. <laughs> right. You know, so if you're willing to pay for it and you love it, then you're interested in it. Yeah. You know? I just, uh, to me, I think at one point, had I not been, you know, running like a maniac when I was a kid yeah, and actually buckled down and went to school and did the right things, I probably would have wound up being a history teacher. 
Yeah. I realize that now. And I go, cool. you know what? I can't be a history teacher, but I can take something that I love. Yeah. And I love the history of it. Yeah. And do the best I can to present it. Well, that's when they first did the Crazy Eddie books. I mean, this is great. People's finally recording this stuff. And then they've done, you know, Dietzel books and books on everybody. I thought, because all this shit was just hearsay. Yeah. You know, and Eddie's just like he's he's uh, talking, you know. And yeah. I said, gee, Eddie, I'm going to cross your name out and write Dana and I'll have this exciting life. You know, because <laughs> Eddie, I, I loved Eddie. You know, he's yeah. a great guy. So I had the privilege to meet all the, the guys that were my heroes. Yeah. And now I said, it's easy getting old, you just don't die. I didn't set the world on fire. I just love tattooing and I still love it. That's why I go to conventions and I- But even that, you know what? Here's how I look at it is, not only are you a, a great tattooer and you've been doing it for a long time, but I love also the fact that you've collected all these great artifacts yeah and my son was getting them all and your son and so now i'm like god oh, geez you know i mean i don't want the money for i'd donate some to museums if there was a museum that was a real museum yeah because a lot of museums fold and there goes your shit you know mm -hmm. tattoo artists tried to have them it's it's tough you know well you gotta have 12 people a year 20 people a year visit who's gonna pay for the building who's gonna pay you know yeah i went to hanky panky's in amsterdam that was the closest to a real museum I'd i ever was just been. gonna ask you about that how uh, was it it was great two yeah. or three floors and he had a polynesian area and a bristol tattoo club bar and he had people working at it in a gift shop and something went amiss and it, it just folded you know uh, i don't know the the whole gist of that now there was also um the didn't shifley or Shifley? Yeah, Shifley. Shifley. Uh, didn't he start the the Ohio Tattoo Club? Yeah, the, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, how you asked me too quick. He's in Sandusky. The first convention was in 1956 at Al Shifley's. Yeah. And Les Goose flew over from England. Right. He had the Bristol Tattoo Club. And uh, my my mentor, D.C. Paul, Huck Spaulding, Paul Rogers, Milton Zeiss, it was like a handful of guys probably drinking beer in the backyard of Al's Shifley's building. I went up and visited that shed. Mm. You know, and the guy said, yeah, I'm tattooed by Al. And his son lived around the corner, and I went and talked to his son, and his son since passed. But, uh, what the hell is it? Sandusky Tattoo Club or the Ohio Tattoo Club? It looked like a crab, but it's a spider. Yeah. And the guy's like, man, I got something you might like. I go, what's that? He said, well, we recited this little shed, and we re-roofed it, and I've got this stack of flyers, and they were from 1959, saying, hi, I'm Al Shifley, and I've tattooed this many years. And I'm, Hell yeah, I'll buy those off yeah, of you. Man. They've been in that attic since 1959. Wow. But all these people had visited Al's, you know, I go, hey, I don't know if it sounds weird, but I'm going to see the shed in the backyard, you know. Yeah. And it was a great time, and he told me where his son lived, and I went around and met him, and we told stories, and his son sold off everything. You know, a lot of people just got rid of stuff. Yeah. And then his son passed, you know. I never met Al, but I know, you know, Smalling Rogers did his back. Dave Paul in my app photo album is acting like he's working on Al. Nice. I, I got Dave Paul's photo album, so I've got pictures of the 56 convention. Okay. All these guys just hanging out. Gee, you know? I can't even, like, fathom what it would have been like to be No, me Al. neither, man. Be like, oh, God, let's move out of the neighborhood. There's a bunch of crazy <laughs> tattoo guys in Al's backyard. Because yeah. it's just a little neighborhood house, you know. And then Al flew over to England later. Well, that's a big deal in 56. Les Gies was a postman, but he really loved tattooing, man. He was dedicated to making it better. He had a massive collection, which he gave to his sons when he passed, and they sold almost all of it off. I'm friends with his, his grandson, Jimmy Skews. Yeah. And Jimmy keeps the club alive. But, you know, most of the collection went to uh, Paul Shudhill and uh, uh, Hanky Panky. Okay. Just nobody cared. Oh, and Don Lucas. Just nobody cared about it. It was yeah. just stuff. See, now I was actually going to do an episode on Les, and uh, I actually talked with Lau Hardy about it. Yeah, yeah, Lau Hardy's a great guy, man. And he told me that I needed to talk to Jimmy. Yeah. He suggested I talk to Jimmy. Jimmy Jimmy's a great historian. Yeah. You know, I mean, he tattooed a little while, then he kind of quit, and then he had some health problems. His dad was Danny Skews that tattooed. His uncle was Billy Skews that tattooed. Yeah. And Billy was married to Rusty Skews that was a tattooed lady. I mean, it's a great generation. But Les Skews was into it. I think they even had a voice recording of Les or something. Jimmy, okay. let me hear. But Jimmy's a great historian. Okay. And you just message Jimmy, you know, and 
he, he will or he won't, but he's a great historian and tell him, you know, you interviewed Dana and you want to know about Les Cuse and uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to do it. That'd be cool. Yeah. I, he, uh, you know, Lyle's been uh, pretty cool to have conversations with and I actually did go to London and, and I planned on just sitting down and introducing myself yeah. and yeah. it turned into an all day event that him and I hung out. Sure, he's a great guy, man. I didn't meet him till, I mean, several years back. And he lost a child also, and Lyle just had some health issues, but he's funny yeah. as hell. You yeah, know, he, he was is. king of the punk rock guys. Yeah. And I went the fuck's Lyle Hardy, and I met him, man, you can't ask for a nicer guy. I go in there, and I, like I said, I, I planned on just being like, hey man, I just want to introduce myself, yeah, whatever. Man. And he's like pulling up chairs, and he said, hold on man, I got a guy come in, he sets up chairs and sitting there, and guy comes in, he says, hey man, uh, you got any of that numbing cream? He goes, you, Pussy. Yeah, oh yeah. And he goes, yeah. right? And he goes, you know, it's going to take an hour. Yeah, yeah. Set. You're supposed to wrap it up an hour yeah. before. He goes, I, yeah, that's fine. And he looks at me and goes, let's go. Yeah. He takes me in the car and we go sightseeing. Yeah, yeah. And then we're driving around. He's like, ah, oh, this is where the dude from Judas Priest lived. And, yeah. and I'm like, and then, you know, we sat there while he tattooed the guy and then told great stories. Yeah. He's a great Let guy. Let me see his little museum sure. upstairs. Yeah. And then uh, he was like, well, what do you want? I said, yeah. well, I, you know, I, I didn't, wasn't, he was like, no, 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 what do you, I said, well, he's like, let me, what, sp what space you got? And he wound up. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing yeah, yeah. Oh, he does them beautifully. He does a lot of Dutch uh, shawl sparrows too, yeah. red and green. And well, I that's what this started out. Yeah. And he went, you got, you hold color pretty, pretty awesome. Well, it's perfect, isn't it? He was like. Man, he can still tattoo so good. It's just perfect. He's know? like, can, you mind if I put more color in there? I said, man, you do whatever the hell you want. Yeah, it's perfect, man. Yeah. Lyle still can tattoo. George Bone can tattoo. He's friends with Flaming H, Sonia Naresh in London. Yeah. They're great people. You know, it's just, yeah, Lyle's a great guy. And his apprentice, Irene, she's just crazy. And she can draw better than anybody. Man. She can really draw. She does some amazing. Yeah. And they do all these funny skits, you know. Yeah. She's dressed up like Jesus, and you know, I just saw one Lyle's dancing or something. He did the one where he does the Cockney. Oh accent. man, I love that. I Cockney. do. I was dying. I'm I like, love it. I mean, all I know is <laughs> apples and pears is the stairs. Me old china, me old china yeah. plate. That's my mate. I wish I knew it because yeah. I love it. I go, what is that? Some secret fucking code like yeah. the wind talkers or something, you know, World War II. But no, he's he's a great guy. And, and that's the fun. You know, I'd heard him for years and several years ago I went over and it was Jimmy Skews and me and Lyle and a guy named Jack Ringo. His real name is Jack Day. And we were kind of doing a question and answer. And Lyle told his whole thing. And Jack since passed. But I'll tell you another guy that's wonderful, Paul Sace. That's yeah. why A-C-E. He's like a genius on history, dude. He just records everything. Like if he wanted to re learn about Ed Hardy, he flew to California and introduced himself to Ed Hardy like you did. Yeah. And he's just a genius. I mean, he writes two to three, two to 5,000 words every night for the BBC. And, wow. And uh, he's a Mensa member. And just a wonderful guy, but man, he knows the history. Yeah. I mean, he knows everything. So with me, I, I felt um, intimidated might be the word. Yeah. When I first started doing this, to walk well, up to people, anybody. Well, some people are assholes. Yeah. I mean, you know. I go in a shop and I go, how you doing? They'll go, can I help you? Well, I'm just doing a courtesy visit. I'm from out of town. Well, if you need anything, let me know. Well, okay, fuck you, you know. Yeah. If you want to talk about tattoos, you know, it could be Charlie Wagner walk in there. They don't give a fuck. They're off in their own ego. Yeah. You know, anytime somebody walks in my shop, I'll tattoo. Oh, cool, you a tattoo artist? No, I collect. I go, well, I'm busy right now, but mine's kind of open. I just walk around and make yourself at home. Look at all the cool stuff. I'll be with you as soon as I'm done. Yeah. You like tattooing, I like tattooing. I just, uh, I think I kind of got over it and just said, you know what, man, I got to just nut up and start asking people and start talking, you know, and that's kind of how I've yeah. progressed well, with this. Well, like I said, Joey asked me about Joey. Yeah, he's a cool guy. You know, once you're in, then you're in. Yeah. And once you screw up, then you're screwed up. Yeah. And tattooing, you know, you yeah. fuck me, I'll put the word out, you won't fuck nobody else. I right. know everybody. Yep. And old tattooists are real loyal, man. Yeah. I say, this some bitch, I don't like him, nobody will like you. Right. As far as I'm concerned. And that's why I make it a point of uh, anybody that I, all, that I interview, I say, hey, look, you know, I do my best to take out ums and ahs and pauses. Yeah, yeah. Just so it flows. Yeah. It sounds a little more professional. 
but I'll never doctor it and screw up anybody's wording or yeah, whatever. No. I'm, I'm like, I, you know what I mean? Like, I want to be legit about everything. Yeah. And once I tell people that, they go, okay. And then I show them interviews yeah. I've done. Yeah. And look, I know that there's guys that don't like other guys and stuff like that. But if you look at the stuff, I left it as is. Yeah. The only time I'll remove stuff if it's like maybe political or they talk about a club. Yeah, I try not. I, to, get I try the, not to get into that. I like everybody, but if you're an asshole, then I just don't right. want to do it. But I also like you know, anytime people talk about clubs. Oh yeah, yeah. I yank it because I don't like. I don't want to start. Sure. Any. I mean, I have my political views, and everybody knows them. Some people don't like me. Some do like. It's just my opinion. It's nothing to do right. with politics. I just may like a politician or I may not like him, but I never give a shit who was a yeah. politician. But now America's so divided, it kind of bugs me and kind of bugs me, you know, people are so hateful and so I like, yeah. I want the best for America. Same. You know, I don't give a shit who's the president. Same. But, it, but the country's really divided, which I hate. I just think that um, my mission is to get people to appreciate understand and be excited about the history of this craft yeah 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 like i said i've got friends they don't like one guy well i like him it's nothing to do with me right you know so if i like you i like you i don't care if nobody else likes you you're my friend i'm not that high school gang you know yeah. or, or let's all just hate this guy fuck that you know and i also like you know man i just did an episode on roy boy yeah yeah i met roy boy years and ago it, you know it was a I, it was a pretty cool episode and and i laid it out as is i didn't try to to to, to you know yeah polish it all up yeah. you know what i mean because to me that would have taken away who he actually was oh, yeah yeah but then i also had made people making comments about like oh well you you know you, he groomed the 16 year old and i um, and i didn't even reply back to him because my thought was a i'm not going to feed the trolls yeah but the other part is if they were to actually have a conversation with deb right now sure she would still say that he's like the light of her life. Yeah, yeah, and she lost her son. So, you know, I know Debbie. How are you going to sit there and, and throw, like, you know what I mean? Well, you know, everybody's got opinions. I'll just post my opinion on Facebook, on anything. Say it's coil machines. So, oh, you're old timer and you don't go along. I, I go, look, you're so sensitive. I'll just block your ass because yeah. you aren't on my friends anyway. But if I offend you, this is my wall. I can say what the fuck I want. I don't jump on your wall and complain. Right, go somewhere else. You post anything you want on your wall, I'll scroll right past it. But if I don't like somebody or I say something off color, this is my wall. This right. is my opinion. I've earned my opinion. Yeah. I like anybody that's a nice person. Race, creed, color, sexual preference, religious. I, I could care less. Right, it's about just, the person. Just be a good person. Exactly. And if you, and if you aren't into that, which... Nowadays, a lot of society hitting there, you piss them off. Tough shit. I don't have no peer pressure. Right. I care about my wife and my grandson. <laughs> yeah, unless you're you paying know. my bills or having yeah, sex with yeah. me. Yeah, I'm not a business. little kid in high school. I don't have to belong to this club. Me and my wife hang out. I can count my real friends on one hand. Yeah. And I know thousands of people. Right. But I can count somebody and call on one hand. Right. And that's sad, you know, but that's mm -hmm. the way it is. It's the reality, though. A lot of my friends passed and stuff, yeah. you know. That's just life. You know, you were saying about, uh, you know, the pens and stuff like that. And, and probably, uh, it was about a year ago now, I was at a convention up in North Jersey. If they didn't have music playing, it had been the most quietest oh, convention yeah. I've ever been to because yeah. everybody was using pens. Yeah, well, I'll Oliver Peck gave me a no dildo zone you know, with a pen. <laughs> and I posted, everybody jumped on me. I go, it's Oliver Peck's fault, you know. Right. I go, yeah, of course. I think we're almost jealous of them because they were, of course they work. Look at the work being done with them. 1010 in Paris, you know, said, man, Dana, I went to a pen, a cheap Chinese one, you know, and it just works great. And he's doing this big Japanese. It's absolutely beautiful. I just want to stay with coils. I don't tattoo full time yeah. anymore. What the hell do I want to buy a pen for? You know, I'd buy a yeah. Chinese one. I mean, I picked up one in West Berlin when nobody was looking and I tried to mark on some skin. I go, man, it just feels creepy to me. <laughs> hey, oh, don't take my picture. But of course they work. Yeah. Van Cubans work wonderful. You know, that's the closest thing to a coil machine. Right. I'd probably buy those. I'm OCD. I bought every machine, Paul Rogers, Grimey, Sisyphery, Aaron Kane, God, you name it, Colonel Todd's, uh, you name it, I own them. Right. You know, and I'd mess with them. And, you know, it's just, I'm nuts. <laughs> I'm hoping one of these days I can actually, you know, come up catch you when you're in town and sure anytime and check out your collection man. I, I really want to see it yeah, anytime's welcome i mean that's what we do is we share yeah. our information that's what paul rogers did 
He'd have Philip Lou and Paul Says and Derek Campbell come over from England and Switzerland, spend the whole day with you, dude. And he was yeah. so trusting. Yeah. You know, I mean, he lived in that little trailer and he was just happy as a clam. He corresponded with people. Yeah. And uh, it, that was one of the highlights of my life, meeting Paul Rogers, meeting Artoria Gibbons, you know, Amy Rogers. Yeah. And son, because it all means something to me. I don't give a shit how good you draw. That's a God gift, you know, and, yeah. and good for you. I can't paint a portrait, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I do the best I can do. One last question for you. How did the gold teeth come into play? The gold teeth came into play. I had 15 gold crowns. I have a hundred and some percent overbite, right? Uh -huh. So my bottom teeth wore the inside of my top teeth. First I had one gold tooth. Then my teeth keeps wearing, right? So I had these four replaced, right? So I have 15 gold crowns. Well, then I lost five gold crowns. You know, I probably had $20,000 in my mouth. So the option was they wanted to pull all my bottom. They just kept wearing off. They just rubbed, you know, yeah. they were wearing down to little nubbins. And so uh, I thought, man, I don't want these false teeth. They put four implants in, pop them in. Well, an implant takes really three months to heal because I have two, you know, $11,000 for two. Mm. So this other guy said, no, we can trim your gums and we'll crown your teeth and we'll do bridges. It's cool, let's do it. So I had these four which were probably 8,000, I spent $40,000 on Damn. my teeth. And I've got all gold teeth except these two. And I'm sure I'll probably lose a bridge and all, but I thought, well, who better to spend the money on to me? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you want them white or, or gold. I said, well, I want them gold. I'm a tattoo artist, you know. Nice. Uh, like I said, the funny story, I walked into 7-Eleven last night and a black lady sweeping the floor, right? And she stops like she sees the shark. And she went, oh, hell no. And then she goes, Charisse or something to the cashier. Look at his teeth. And I, I go, yeah, they're real. And they went, oh shit, like that's fucking dope. She said, you the original OG Santa Claus. <laughs> ah, nice. And I said, well, there'll be a legend of a white guy with gold teeth. And the only reason I'm asking the question yeah. is because I knew you, I, I yeah. knew what you look like. Yeah. And then when I met you in New York and you, you started talking to me, I went, yeah. God damn, he's got gold teeth, and I never, I yeah, guess, because I've never it. seen it you know, in a I, picture. I posted it on the goddamn Instagram because everybody said, that's a nice grill. I go, why in the fuck would I wear a grill? I'm not a rapper. I go, I just had my teeth replaced. I got an, I've got a bridge here. I've got two bridges here. I've got two implants here. Yeah. It was 40 grand. Took a year to do it. Wow. And I already had these four. And I'm sure I'll lose more. And I'd already spent 20 grand on the other ones that they took off to do these. But it's my money, fuck you. you know, yeah. If you don't like them, don't look at them. Hey, you know what? It's not a tattoo question, but I was like, you know what? I well, I, I'm glad to get it clear because even one of my customers, Dana, where'd you get that grill? Now, why in the fuck would I wear a grill every day? I knew it wasn't a grill. No, nah, no. Nah, yeah, I could tell it was your real so teeth. So I could eat a rock now. You know, I have great teeth. But, uh, you know, if I lose one, then yeah. I'll, I'll just have to fix it. That's, That's my money and my teeth, you know. <laughs> Dana, I want to thank you. Yeah, well, much appreciate my it, man. pleasure, man. Thank Thanks so to much. you guys for keeping history alive. And like I said, I'm so accessible. Anybody can message me on Instagram, Dana Brunson. I'm just around, you know. I mean, just be a nice human. I'll be happy to help you with anything. Come visit us. Just message and make sure I'm in the country. There you go. Yeah, this is what I do. Thank you, man. I appreciate okay, it. Okay, man, thank you. Thank you so much.